my name is Erin Finnegan, and the name of my thesis is Hello World, and this is the uh, URL, hello-world.tv. It is the pilot episode of a Sesame Street-like web series that teaches basic coding concepts to kids. So I grew up in the 80s watching a lot of PBS, and um, sort of a passive learning experience of science. I grew up and I worked in children's television for a number of years. And before anyone gets to the question I want to answer, does everyone really need to learn how to code? So I have a picture of a scribe from medieval Europe, and he's getting paid just to be literate, which is not something that comes up today as much. Uh, so my answer to this question is really, is your life better because you know how to read? Uh, when I came to ITP and I learned how to code, uh, I felt much more literate in the world around me, and I'm excited about that kind of literacy, and I want to share it with people. So that's my motivation for this project. I really like this quote from Play Turkey. For 100 years after it started, the printing press plunged Europe into a period of intellectual and political chaos. And I kind of think between the microprocessor and the internet, that's sort of where we're at today as a society. And also getting this out of the way up front, let's all go crazy about STEM careers. I know that there's a this current sort of cultural milieu to push people and kids into STEM. That's not really my motive here. I wanted to learn how to code if I wasn't using it for art. And I learned uh, a love of making games to so be. I was really inspired by Dan Schiffman's uh, flipped classroom videos. Uh, but I looked at them and I thought, wow, these would be so much better if they had like higher production values and also maybe puppets. So, <laughs> and so I filmed an episode zero of my show uh, last winter, the ITP show, where I got to live out my dream of filming Dan Schiffman with puppets. So <laughs> without further ado, here's about a minute from Hello World. Hi, welcome. I'm Mimi and this is Giraffe. Hello. And Pig. Pig. And today, we're going to learn about conditionals. What? I thought this was Sesame Street. No, this show is about coding for the computer. But I don't even own a computer. That's OK. All you need is some paper and a pencil, and you can follow along. Well, I know the word conditionals. Like, I'm allowed to play video games on the condition that I do my homework first. That's right, that's a conditional statement. Huh. So if you do your homework, that's the condition, then you get to play video games. Uh -huh. What are those curly things? Those are braces or curly brackets. Oh. Let's try a conditional statement. If you're a yellow giraffe, give me a high five. <laughs> <laughs> so programmers would say that if the condition is true inside the parentheses, which is if you're a yellow giraffe, then we get to do a high five. And the high five part is the code that is going to execute. <gasps> execute? Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> execute isn't as bad as it sounds. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why puppets? Um, I'm really drawn to the Japanese product design aesthetic of making things more cute to make them less intimidating to the end user. I thought making coding concepts cuter might make it a little less scary for average people. I took the puppets class at ITP. I did some puppet training at a professional studio outside of ITV, and ultimately I decided to bring in professional puppeteers that I hired from a puppet studio called Puppetsburg. Here they are behind the scenes. I also worked with a talented bunch of ITP alumni and current students and friends of alumni. Uh, I was still needed to create my own characters, and although I rented puppets for this particular shoot, going forward I, I hired uh, someone to design characters. This is a mock-up of the color concept characters. Um, and then the thesis committee said, you need to pick a two-year age range to put your project at. I thought that was a little bit limiting. This is a recent episode of Sesame Street with a Game of Thrones parody. <laughs> Sesame Street's core demographic is three to five-year-olds who I don't think should be watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly, like, it's for a range of audience uh, members. So for my research, I asked, what age do kids start thinking that they're bad at computers? And I asked a lot of different experts and people who teach kids to code and work at after school programs and some more alumni. And the resounding answer from everyone was fourth and fifth graders. So I decided to aim the project at fourth and fifth graders. I did some more research and found, tried to figure out, like, if you're in fourth and fifth grade right now, what is your exposure to coding? So computer science is only offered at one out of ten high school, not one out of ten schools in America right now. But a lot of the kids I ran into, actually all of them, have participated in the hour of code. 20 million students for spin in 2013. It's backed by a company called Code.org, which is a nonprofit with really deep pockets. It's funded by like Gates, Zuckerberg, Apple, and Microsoft. Um, I went to the inside, I went to a professional development teacher training day at a Code.org event, where I worked through a lot of their curriculum. Their pockets are so deep they have licensed Angry Bird characters. This is, from, uh, this is from within their curriculum. They're using a programming language called Blocky, where you solve these little puzzles to move the code through maze. 
Walkie is, of course, what's used in Scratch. Scratch is developed by MIT for people who are more visual-based or like not really coding people to begin with. And what Scratch doesn't really teach you is computer syntax, and it doesn't ever have error messages. So you just drag blocks of code together, and it either works or it doesn't work. And I really think, as a beginning programmer, those are the elements of sort of pain and fear, <laughs> the syntax and the dreadful error messages that come with learning how to program. So I wanted to try and bridge that gap between what Scratch and code editor are doing and then moving on to actual code like JavaScript. Um, the other problem that teachers talk about a lot was that for fourth and fifth graders, the computer is a game machine. Even kids logging onto the Scratch website, they get really distracted playing like other kids' Scratch games without really, and spending more time doing that than working on their own games. Like this Tumblr image, what do you want to do? Like computer game. So I took, <laughs> I, took, <laughs> I took more inspiration from ITP. On the first day of Danny Rosen's introduction and computational media class, we had our people from our class volunteer to stand up and do this exercise where people follow little bits of instructions on paper to pass marbles back and forth through two lines and then sing a song. And at the time, I thought, this is kind of dumb. <laughs> but later, as I learned how to code, I was like, whoa, wait, no, that was really informative. And I really learned a lot from that. And I kind of kept coming back to that moment. So I wanted to include an offline component to the videos that's at least suggested. Poor <laughs> Bella Marshall also has offline activities like this is the video she does that you know, all these teachers are doing on the training day. And this guy like very deep within the curriculum. So I had a play test and I developed a game where people write pseudocode and kind of intentionally leave in errors and play tested it at ITP with some adults first, where we came up with stuff like if you if you've never known a snow angel, it's the most embarrassing moment. And then I took it in front of kids. These are kids at an after school program called the Beam Center, the fourth and fifth graders. Um, and I had them write pseudo code dares to each other and sort of modified truth or dare. So they came up with great stuff like if you have red hair, run around screaming, I'm Elmo, else sit quietly. If you exist, hug everyone in the room, else live. <laughs> so, for my next group of playtesters, I came up with a more comprehensive adjusted rule set that included no kissing because that came up immediately. Um, and then I took it to a lot of Aaron's class at, in their public school in Washington Heights, where they're actually they are learning the code that curriculum and they just learned a lesson on conditional, so sort of reinforcing what they learned. But I showed them the video and had them take a survey about it, and then we tried the game that I suggested. If you like cats, say meow. Else, say hi. 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 Yeah. If your name starts with a J, tell us the name of a celebrity you have a crush on or think is cute. Else? Selena Gomez. Oh. Else, lick your elbow. Try to lick your elbow. Oh, Kim Kardashian. Oh, for the, for the classroom, I developed a lot of sort of worksheets and other handouts that went along with the lesson, reinforcing the code that was in the lesson plan, and demonstrating how to play the game, where part of it was to leave in er errors intentionally and have your partner read them and figure out what you left out. I'd like to include that kind of supplemental material on the website. Ultimately, I'd love for users who watch the videos and try the games to come up with their own iterations on them and come up with suggestions. I'd also like it to either be like you can watch it as a passive learning experience, just one episode after another, or you can watch it in a classroom setting. The website is live right now, it's just got a few of the videos uh, that I've posted so far. And there was a big question as to whether or not kids would, fifth graders would think that these videos were for kids younger than them because they involve puppets. So in the survey I asked, how old are you and do you think this was for kids younger than you or the same age as you? Out of the maybe like 35 kids who I had took the survey, only two of them thought it was for kids younger than them. They were 11 year olds. I also asked other questions like, how do you describe the video using one or two words? This kid says perfect. <laughs> I, um, I like this is the youngest kid who took the survey. He said he would watch the second episode if there were more cute animals. And a lot of the fifth graders were either very polite or very positive. They wrote things like, this could be a new big thing, or I think, I think what you did could be the Netflix. I think what you did could be the next big thing that people will love. Good luck. <laughs> Very cute. Um, and the last group of playtesters that I playtested with had the least coding experience. They just didn't even ask. So it's just on YouTube. They're going to the next episode. Uh, I would like future episodes to cover sort of basic coding concepts that are universal, no matter like what programming language you're working in. Usually they're always like functions and arrays and things like that. 
So here's another minute. I hope you can. Okay, here's my code. It says, if the show is over, give me a hug. Is the show over? All right. Aww. Wait, I've got another one. Okay. If the show is over, give Pig $5. <laughs> nice try. So, if you want to try this at home, you can check out our show page for more examples and suggestions. And send me $5. And send Pig $5, please. What's next for me? <laughs> My due date is July 14th. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to launch a Kickstarter to find a second episode and hopefully also like future episodes. So that's coming soon. And then I want to thank all these people. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the question because my mom is watching from home. But Tom asked if, uh, did kids have trouble with the syntax? And I think the more coding experience they had already, like, the less trouble they had. The kids with the least coding experience, I really had to, like, walk them through, like, okay, no, wait, you got to draw these, like, curly brackets to surround them. So they required a little bit more instruction. But it, overall, they weren't overwhelmed by it. I did have a shot in the video where it's, like, here are conditionals in different programming languages, and it was sort of screenshots of different stuff. And that particular shot, like, freaked out adults, <laughs> like, who would often, like, pause the video and be like, oh, my God, that's overwhelming. But with kids, they, like, they didn't mind. They were just sort of like, whatever, it's all new. Is there a reason you went with the C-style syntax as opposed to a white space syntax? Is there no C-style syntax? Yeah, I think uh, we kind of, I didn't know before making these videos. I did research and found that, yeah, like, C-style things are in the curly bracket family of languages. Um, and I think like the brackets and things are tough for beginners. And a lot of kids do learn like Python and stuff. Once you reach out from Python, like that sort of punctuation becomes important. And in some languages, like the white space itself is important. Uh, if some of the characters end up being cut out as you move forward, can you keep pig, please? <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother wants to know if pig can be kept in going forward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think everyone really reacted really well to pig, and so I would try and like come up with a definite name for him. And there is a pig character in the character designs that like looks different, but it's still a pig. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs>